power and force that you blast your opponents with. Mr. Stevens, I'd probably make a much better president. Why, Mr. President, I've never found you lacking in eloquence, sir. <laughs> but unfortunately, you are as stubborn as the orneriest mule in your own Tennessee. He just plants his feet wide apart like that, and you couldn't budge him with a cannon. <laughs> a mule, huh? That way you fellas in Congress lit a fire under me? <laughs> but you don't act like our fire does much more than keep your belly nice and warm. <laughs> Unfortunately, Mr. President, the contraption your hit to is the United States of America. You've got to keep it on the move. Stevens, if you'll just state your case and let me state mine, I think we'll see better where we stand. Very good, Mr. President. I propose that we treat the South as an outside conquered people that we confiscate all estates worth $10,000 and containing 200 acres. Then, sir, I would give every adult colored man 40 acres of land. Sell the rest and pay for the war with it. No use vetoing that program, Johnson. We have the votes to override your vetoes. So it comes to this. You fought a war to preserve the Union. Having preserved it now, you deny that it exists. Gentlemen, my one aim is to carry out Lincoln's policies. Try and get into your head that Lincoln's reconstruction program died with him. Oh, shut up, Waters. Let the president state his own case. Lincoln always held that the Confederate states could not secede, that they were therefore never out of the Union. Now they stopped fighting, they took the oath of allegiance to the United States. They ratified the amendment abolishing slavery that you yourself, Stevens, piloted through Congress. Uh, uh, uh. That follows from Lincoln's policy that they therefore were entitled to the same rights as the rest of us. Now, gentlemen, it's just as simple as that. First, Lincoln tried to block me. Now it's you. Well, that's a poor substitute, but... Now me. Stevens, why did you want to see me alone? To tell you that since you've turned me down, I fear I'll have to turn you out. Impeachment? You know the House would prefer charges of high crimes and misdemeanors against you any time I say. I hope that never happens. Unfortunately, it takes a two-thirds vote of the Senate to sustain a conviction. That's the country. You're a great stickler for the Constitution, aren't you? Well, you might as well know, then. We can get you out by strictly constitutional means. What's this about some amnesty idea of yours, Johnson? Well, your spy in my cabinet told you that, too. Well, after you broke up my meetings, I got to wondering whether I had any powers left at all. I hadn't better resign and go back home. I'll oh, cut the cackle. And then I remembered a power vested in the president by the Constitution that even Congress can't touch, Stevens. Maybe you can guess what it is. Power Congress can't touch? Yes. Lincoln would have got around to that before now, but I had to wait till things settled down a bit. He wouldn't dare. That's right, you've guessed it. The pardoning power. I'm going to sign something now, and I... Glad you came over here to watch me do it. Here at this desk where Lincoln freed the slaves, I now free their former masters. This proclamation pardons all and restores full citizenship to all who fought for the lost cause in the war between the states. All? Did you say all? All. Not Jeff Davis. Jeff Davis, too. Lee? Oh, yes. Lee as well. Well, you're right. You have the power. Congress can't stop me. Now every rebel snake in the South will crawl out of his hidden den into the daylight. Johnson, what you've just done tonight and what you plan to do means a new civil war. You honestly believe that, don't you? You know I do. I haven't long to live. 
just kept alive for the day of retribution and justice so I could die happy knowing I decreed the country peace. Peace? You call revenge, confiscation, and disfranchisement peace? You no know, pity for those four million injured, oppressed, hopeless colored people under bondage for two centuries? I want the two races to live together peacefully, to respect one another. Your way of making slaves of the whites would put that off another century. Johnson, if you withdraw this thing, for the sake of peace, I'll quash the impeachment. So you drop the impeachment? Huh? Yeah. Well, Stevens, I decline your offer. But I want to tell you one thing. I never really understood you until this minute. I always thought you wanted a puppet president you could boss. I called you a hypocrite. You're not. You're a very sincere man. And that's what makes you so dangerous. You have the sincerity and will and force. You have the drive of a great fanatic. You'll not rob me of all I've lived for. You'll not ruin the country with another war. I live long enough to stop that. My policies will go through with you out of the way. Even if I'm not here to see it. Stevens, what's the matter with you? You better let me get you some coffee. Yeah. yeah. I'll crush you, Johnson. I'll save our country here. Johnson's aim is to bring the white South and the white North back together. African Americans just do not play a role in Johnson's vision of the post-war South other than to go back to work and be landless and rightless plantation laborers. Johnson's contempt for the freedmen infuriated many in Washington, and none more than Thaddeus Stevens. The congressman from Pennsylvania had been a fierce abolitionist long before the war. Within the Republican Party, he led a small, vocal faction known as the Radicals. These were principled men. Before the war, they had been the strongest Republicans opposing the expansion of slavery. During the Civil War, they had been the first ones to call for arming of black troops for issuing an Emancipation Proclamation. Long before there was any conceivable political benefit to be gained from supporting the rights of black people, they were doing it. The radical Republicans had a vision of what Reconstruction should be. They believed it should be longer in duration. They believed the Southern states had left the Union and had destroyed their status as states. They had to be reinvented. To Thaddeus Stevens, Reconstruction meant not only safeguarding and preserving the essential results of the Civil War, but in his vision, it meant remaking the South. It meant the increase of democracy in terms of representation. It meant the spread of the right of suffrage. The radicals' hard line marginalized them within their own party. Most Republicans feared the radicals' position on black rights would drive away white voters in the North. It is the radical wing which is the most sympathetic to black people. The party in general was committed to a limited program of civil rights, 
protection of property, education, etc. But the party is not in any way committed to any sort of radical restructuring of Southern society. Johnson's Reconstruction Plan could not be challenged until Congress convened in December. That summer, radical leaders could only watch as scores of planters descended on Washington, pleading to be pardoned. Whose petition would be denied or granted was uncertain. Still, former Confederates were hopeful. White men alone, President Johnson told one senator, must manage the South. In December 1865, the 39th Congress, the first since the end of the Civil War, convened in Washington. More than 60 former Confederates prepared to take their seats, including four generals, four colonels, and six Confederate cabinet officers. Even Alexander H. Stevens, the former vice president of the Confederacy, expecting, as one observer put it, to govern the country he had been trying to destroy. If the South was going to rise again, so to speak, control its own political life, control the freed people, indeed, if ex-Confederates themselves were going to be allowed back into leadership at the national level, then to so many white Northerners it seemed like the war would have been fought in vain. On the opening day, the clerk of the House refused to announce the names of the Southern delegates in his roll call. The former Confederates were denied their elected seats and sent packing. The fight for control of Reconstruction had begun. In many ways, Congress was a poisoned atmosphere in the debates over the Reconstruction policy. There were raw war memories being played out. There were visceral hatreds being played out on the floor of Congress between Republicans and Democrats. These debates are between men who have experienced this war, who have fought this war. They are fighting literally about the meaning of that conflict they have just fought. Northern Democrats sided with Johnson and railed against Republicans across the aisle. Washington must get out of the way, they insisted, and let Southerners run their own affairs. The Democrats had always identified themselves as the party of the white man. They very explicitly said, we are here to protect the rights of white men, north and south. And how do we do that? We hold the union together. For that reason, the Democrats saw themselves as trying to put north and south together as quickly as possible during the Civil War, and as soon as it's over, trying to knit north and south together at the expense of black men. At one point in the debates, Thaddeus Stevens stood up and answering his Democratic colleagues, says, do not, I pray you, admit those who have slaughtered half a million of our countrymen until their clothes are dried and until they are reclad. I do not wish to sit side by side with men whose garments smell of the blood of my kindred. It was Stephen's way of saying, we're going to keep the South out of the Union as long as we can, and we're not going to allow anybody back in here who was responsible for making the war. A Congressional Committee on Reconstruction concluded that Southern governments were unable to keep law and order or stem violence against African Americans. Allowing Southern states unchecked power so soon after the war, the committee said, was madness and lunacy. Moderate Republicans had hoped to persuade Johnson to provide minimal protections for blacks in the South. Now, even they were growing impatient with the president's policies. President, egotistic to the point of mental disease, 
insincere as well as stubborn, cunning as well as unreasonable, vain as well as ill-tempered. That fall, Republicans won three-fourths of the seats in both houses of Congress, enough to override any Johnson veto. In only 18 months, the radicals had gone from a fringe minority to the center of Republican leadership. Now it was their turn to define the course of Reconstruction. Thaddeus Stevens was 75 years old, so frail that he had to be carried into the House of Representatives by admirers. In a voice his colleagues could barely hear, the tireless Stevens made a final plea for federal intervention in the southern states. Congress has been sitting here, and while the South has been bleeding at every pore, Congress has done nothing to protect the loyal people there, white or black, either in their persons, in their liberty, or in their property. In March 1867, both houses of Congress again rejected a veto by President Johnson and passed the Radicals' Reconstruction Plan. The former Confederate states were divided into five military districts, each commanded by a general with power to enforce law and administer justice. New Southern governments would be created. They would have to ratify the 14th Amendment their new state constitutions would have to be approved by Congress. And black men would have the right to vote. This really was a remarkable leap in the dark for world history. It's the first large-scale experiment in interracial democracy that had existed anywhere.